Well, uh, I am going to be talking about Yom Kippur today, and we did do this, but uh, the audio did not record, so I'm kind of doing this over, so it may not be as um, dynamic as it should be, but it'll probably have better audio. <laughs> uh, anyway, we are uh, coming off of the heels here of the Feast of Trumpets, which we celebrated last week, and then now that moves after 10 days of awe into Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is simply the Day of Atonement, and then five days after that we have Trump, um, the Tabernacles or Sukkot. And so what I wanted to kind of do is just kind of show you why we celebrate Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur here in Leviticus 16.3, it says that it was a solemn, a day of solemn rest, and that you are to afflict your souls, and it is a statute of forever. And so as a result of the idea that you are to rest, you do no work. It is a Sabbath and it is the only day in which if a this ordinance, this celebration, this observance, I should say, when it falls on a Sabbath day that you are to fast. Normally you do not fast on a Sabbath day because a Sabbath is for rest and for enjoyment, really, uh, to be holy and to be with the Lord. This is a day, though, that you are to afflict your soul, and so therefore they will um, fast on this day. And one of the things that they do is that because it is a time of repentance, they have this prayer that they will confess their sins. And so as a result, they will often say the name, uh, or I should say repeat this prayer ten times, because the name of God, Yahweh, was repeated ten times on this day by the high priests when they celebrated this in the Old Testament. And so what this prayer, this confession of sins is, here's an example. We're not going to do it to save some time, but uh, basically they will go and they say during the Amidah prayer, uh, during the Yom Kippur service, they have this prayer, which has two different parts. The first part is basically uh, meaning we have been guilty, and the second part for the sin. So on the first part, what they do is they will basically say things like this. We have transgressed, we have betrayed, we have robbed, we have spoken slander, we have acted perversely and have wrought wickedness, we've sinned willfully, we have been violent, we've accused falsely, we've counseled evil, and it goes on. We've been stiff-necked, abominable, committed iniquity, transgressed, we have oppressed, uh, all of these things. In essence, what they're going to do is they will take each of the 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet and confess a sin for that. And then in the second part, al-chet, they will actually take two sins for each of the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. And so as a result, um, it's introspection here. They are, are searching their soul for things that they have done wrong. And oftentimes in churches, uh, you know, I grew up in a church where we would basically confess our sins every Sunday. The problem was, is it was very general. It didn't really have anything to do with my life, at least, I, and it's not the fault of the church. It was my own fault. But bottom line is, you know, I confess I'm a, I'm a sinner. Well, you see, God wants more than that. He doesn't want us just to say, I'm a sinner. He wants us to be specific, examine our soul, examine our hearts to find out what uh, is wrong with us, basically. That, you know, in our churches, we don't say, uh, speak against pornography because we know that there are people in the church with that. We don't talk about divorce because we know there are divorced people. We can't talk about abortion because we know that there are people in the congregation who have had an abortion. You can't talk about anything specific, so let's just keep it general. We've sinned. But that's not what we need to do. You see, this is a time to really reflect upon the heart and say, I have been greedy. I have been slanderous. I have been a liar. I have been, you know, all kinds of these things. And so I, I, I like that specificness about it. And as they go and they confess these sins, they will beat their breast, uh, beat their chest like that, and um, really, as I said, reflect. So and because this is such a holy day, the holiest day of the year, everything closes down on Yom Kippur. 
And then they will basically also allow people who have been previously barred from the synagogue back, but only on one um, requirement, and that is they have to be willing to repent. They have to be willing to want to come back in. And I think that's very significant as well, because you see, atonement isn't for just anybody who says, yeah, okay, I'll take that. You have to be repentant. You have to want to um, turn your life around. And that is really what Christianity is all about. It isn't about, okay, yeah, I'll take that. No, you first repent of your sins. And this is why there is a confession of sins before there will ever be an absolution of them, an atonement of them. And this is a mandatory fast for everybody unless you are under uh, 12 years old for a girl and 13 years old for a boy. So no entertainment, that type of thing. And this is the type of thing that they still do to this day. And because of what Leviticus says, afflict your souls. Now, uh, I'm not going to get into too many details, but I want you to see here that the uh, service, the evening service for Yom Kippur would begin with a sorrowful melody, basically a song of sorrow. And then they sound the shofar. Everybody wears white clothing to show purity. And then some of the Orthodox, they'll spend the whole night in the synagogue, but a lot of them will just spend the evening. Then they go home. And after this is all over, the next day they will begin building their sukkah, which is basically a temporary shelter that they will live in for the, the next five days um, once uh, Sukkot begins on the 15th day of the month. And again, here is the 10th day of the month. And so anyway, uh, this is a time to really focus and get ready. And the reason being is because of what this is all about. Trumpets, as we said, is a picture of the Lord coming back. We see that the trumpets are going to blow and the Lord comes back in the clouds, right? It's in 2 Thessalonians. It's in 1 Corinthians 15. It's in Revelation. We see on the sixth seal, when it is broken, there are seven trumpets that are about to be blown. And we see that at the seventh trumpet, when you read that in Revelation 11, that the Lord comes back, that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God. And so the trumpets, as we talked about last week, was a time of preparation. But a preparation for what? Well, not only the Lord's return, but for you to be ready for the Lord's return. And so once trumpets is blown, there's the 10 days of awe. Now, I don't know if these 10 days of awe have anything to do with the tribulation or not, but some people say that because uh, in Revelation it talks that there will be these 10 days of testing that are coming upon the earth, that the trumpets begin and then you have the 10 days of testing where you are to be preparing yourself because the Lord is coming back and atonement is going to be done. Now we're going to talk about going to be done here in a minute because ultimately atonement has been finished, but we'll talk about that here in a little while. In a little while. Anyway, um, Romans chapter 3 verse 25 says, God presented him, Yeshua, Jesus, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. You see, Jesus was the Passover lamb. We know that he died on Passover, but he also is fulfilling atonement here, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Because it doesn't just say God presented him as a sacrifice of the Passover lamb, but the sacrifice of atonement. This is specific. And so when we think of Yeshua and Jesus dying on the cross, you cannot think of just him being the Passover lamb only and waiting for him to come back on the Day of Atonement to bring atonement. Atonement has been made by Yeshua on the cross. But we have to realize that when Jesus died on the cross, it didn't just bring forgiveness for us. It also means that there are going to be those who will be judged. And that is a very important part to remember. Because what is good for us when Yeshua comes back, that atonement is going to be completely finished and carried out just like, and by that I mean this, the devil, is he in hell yet? No, he's not. He stands condemned. It's like the judge says, you're guilty, but 
the bailiff has not carried the, the, the guilty one off to take him to prison yet. The pronouncement of guilty, the pronouncement of innocence has been made, but we have not been led off to heaven or led off to hell yet. And so what we're seeing is that atonement has been made, but the final blessing of it is not complete until the Lord returns. And this is why I believe he is going to be coming back at the time of trumpets and atonement and so on. And so while John says, behold, <clears throat> excuse me, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, recognizing him as the Passover Lamb, we also see here Paul recognizing him as the sacrificial atonement. Hebrews 9 says this in verses 11 through 13, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's important because, you see, you didn't go into the most holy place except for one time a year, and even then only the high priest. So Jesus, our high priest, goes into the most holy place with his blood. Normally, the blood of the goat was taken in that one day of the year and atonement was made. Now, the difference between Passover and atonement is this. Passover was for personal sins. Each individual household had a lamb and their blood was put on each of the houses. Atonement was made for the entire community, for not only sins that you, you know, unintentionally committed, but even intentional sins. All sins were covered for the entire nation of Israel on that day. And so I'm not saying that everybody's going to be saved. What I'm saying is this. Passover was for uh, Yeshua when he dies on the cross. Every one of us has to make that personal reflection and say, yes, I repent of my sins and I accept the free gift that Yeshua has given me. And we accept it only by the power of the Holy Spirit and God drawing us to him. But the day of atonement, when he comes back, everyone who is under the blood of of that covenant of Passover is saved. But everyone who is not under the blood of that Passover will be judged. And this is why, because he entered the most holy place and he does it once for all, it says here. Having obtained eternal redemption is why when Yeshua dies on the cross, that that curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place is torn in two. Now, that curtain wasn't just some little curtain that somebody could have you know, caught a little hem of it and it just started to unravel. Uh, the historical records tell us this thing, two oxen couldn't tear it apart. So when this happened, this was a miracle, not an accident, an absolute miracle of God. And it was telling us something, that now because of Yeshua's blood, atonement had been made, that we have access to go into the place that normally only the high priest could go into once a year, we now have access to, and at all times. What was in the most holy place? The presence of God, the uh, mercy seat. And by Jesus, by his flesh, by his body that was broken for you, we now have access. And by the way, the Bible says that his body is that curtain. And that being broken, that being torn, allows you to have access to the Father. Access that you didn't have before Yeshua. And so this is a huge deal to recognize Jesus as the atonement sacrifice. Because without that, you would not be able to go into his presence and basically have that mercy seat. You would need a mediator every year to, to continue doing this sacrifice. But as Hebrews so clearly tells us, there is no need for sacrifice anymore because Yeshua did it once for all. And even this tabernacle on earth was simply a picture of what was in heaven. 
And so while the earthly tabernacle had to be cleansed with the blood of goats, the heavenly tabernacle had to be cleansed with the blood of Jesus. And that is what he has done. Now, the prophetic significance of Yom Kippur, I've kind of touched on, but just to to give you kind of a little bit of an outline of this, we see that the Feast of Trumpets, uh, it it ends the seals of Revelation chapter 6 when we see the trumpets beginning. And we see that our bodies will be changed in a twinkling of an eye, in a flash, in an instant, but when at the last trumpet. And then after trumpets, which we see there in Revelation 6 beginning, you have the days of awe, the 10 days, which may be the vials of Revelation or maybe even possibly the trumpets of Revelation or both. That the seals take place, then you have the other uh, tribulations that are going on where I believe there is going to be a separation between God's people and those who are not. And this is why in Matthew chapter 24 it says immediately after the tribulation of those days the sun will be darkened. And after the tribulation or after the ten days of awe perhaps then we see the vials and the sun is completely darkened. But After that, then, what happens? Well, Judgment Day, and that would be the Day of Atonement. The Day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. The heavens will pass away, and we see that everything is going to be burned up because Judgment Day has come, and He will say, you are innocent because of the blood of Jesus. You are guilty because you did not have the blood of Jesus on you. And then after atonement or judgment day, what happens? Revelation 19, we see the the feast of tabernacles and the wedding banquet of the Lamb, a celebration. And so this is exactly the order of Revelation, is trumpets, judgment, and then living with God. The very same order of these festivals. And that is not an accident. Now, if you remember in the spring festivals, we see Jesus dies the very day of Passover. He rises from the dead on the very day of first fruits. And he gives the Holy Spirit on the very day of Pentecost or Shavuot. So if the spring festivals, Yeshua followed to a T and to the day, why would he not do to a T and to the day on the rest of the festivals. I believe he's going to. Now, today we're going to focus on atonement. Tabernacles is going to be coming up this week as we we, uh, celebrate this festival of tabernacles or Sukkot. I will be explaining how Yeshua fulfilled it perfectly. But I want you to see that there's stuff that's future that we're celebrating here. Not just past, but future as well. Now, Colossians 2.16 talked about this. We talked about it last week, but just to remind you, let no one judge you in regarding the festivals and the new moons because the substance is of Christ. In other words, we are not, this isn't saying don't do them. It's saying if you do these things, don't let anybody judge you because it's a good thing. It's about Jesus. It's not about being Jewish. It's not about keeping the law. It's about recognizing and remembering Jesus because Jesus did and God told us to keep these as a festival or an ordinance forever. Now the other thing here in Leviticus, going back there, we're going to kind of follow through a little bit what it talks about here in chapter 16 about the Day of Atonement. It says in verse 2, And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil. You see, you you can't go into the most holy place any time you want, only once and on the Day of Atonement. Now, Yeshua changed all of that. Now, any time we want, notice that we have to want to, but when we want, we have access because that veil, that curtain, was tore when Yeshua died on the cross and resurrected. But specifically at his death, when he became the atonement sacrifice. And it says that is before the mercy seat. Why would you go into that place? Well, to receive mercy, which we have received now because of Yeshua. 
which is on the ark, lest he die, for I will appear in a cloud above the mercy seat. Now, the priest, you see, had to make sacrifices here, first for himself and then for the people. He had to be clean before he could enter into God's presence. And the only reason you can now enter into that most holy place to the mercy seat is because somebody has made you clean. A sacrifice was made, and that is Jesus. Now it continues, Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic, the linen trousers on his body, be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turban. He shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on. So there are four parts or four pieces of clothing, all of them linen, that are put on. Because as Aaron, the priest here, the high priest at this time before Yeshua, he had to be holy and clean. And this, these white linens are a picture of purity and righteousness. Now, as I said before, uh, we know that white is a picture of our righteousness because I'm not making this up. Scripture says it. And this is why people wear white on the Day of Atonement, because you are pure. It is a, a picture of purity. And so I'm going to show you what the priest normally looked like, but before I do, I want you to understand that there always has to be a sacrifice in order for sins to be forgiven. Uh, when I took people to Israel the first time here in, in Nebraska, I took them to what is called the Temple Institute, where they have all of these um, uh, pieces of the temple ready to go. And I asked the people, because you know, they basically worked there, because I knew what their answer would be, but I wanted our group to hear this. How can you be forgiven? Because if forgiveness had to be by the blood of a sacrifice, which is what the Old Testament says, then how could you be forgiven if there is no temple today? What do all these people who have died without a temple, what are they doing? Their sins cannot be atoned for. Well, their answer is one that a rabbi gave after the destruction of Jerusalem. Basically, you have to pray and give alms and basically good works. Well, that is a lie from the pit of hell and one that many denominations today even practice, that you have to do something in order to be saved, to be atoned for. No, you can't. Well, we see that as an excuse of this, they will use examples and say that there was forgiveness in the Old Testament without sacrifices. As an example, Jonah was forgiven. Well, I should say the Ninevites were forgiven in the book of Jonah. And there was no sacrifice for the Ninevites. Yes, there was a picture of it. You see, the whole picture of it was this. Jonah was swallowed by a whale taken to the depths of the earth. And as you see his prayer, some say that he actually did die and he was resurrected. If he didn't really die, we see the picture of that sacrifice that points us to Jesus who would die, go to the belly of the earth, and is resurrected out on the land. David, they say, David murdered Uriah, yet yet he didn't have a sacrifice to atone for his sins. Well, yes, first of all, the temple was up and going at that time. And second of all, there was a sacrifice, a cost. His son died as a result of this. There was a life for a life. And this is a picture that is illustrated all throughout Scripture, pointing us to the fact that there would be a day when there had to be a life given, Yeshua's, to make perfect atonement. And it was the only way that atonement could be done. So anyway, um, very important to understand that concept. But here is a picture of the priests. You see, normally they had eight different garments on. Here on the left, you can see all of the, he was decked out with all of these ornaments. But on this day of the Day of Atonement, these four garments, all white linen. And you're going to see that when he makes the sacrifice, he would then take these clothes off and they were never to be worn again. And that is extremely important as well. Why? You will see in a moment.
Revelation 3.17 says, Because you say I am rich and you have become wealthy and have need of nothing, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. You see, he wants you to get rid of all the filth in your life and put on white garments. If you go buy a white t-shirt, does that make you clean? No, this is a picture that you may be clothed in righteousness. And that is the picture of this priest being clothed here in this white linen. You see, Revelation 19, 8 tells us, and to her it was granted, that is, the, the believers, the church, to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Notice, not just the righteousness imputed by Jesus, that you can say, yeah, I, I want Jesus, and now all of a sudden you just become white without living it out for Jesus. Notice the righteous acts of the saints. That means the works. Now, am I preaching works righteousness? Of course not. What I'm saying is, is that if you truly believe in Jesus, you will respond. Just like if you really believe your favorite football team is the best team, when they make a touchdown, you cheer. You do something. You don't sit there like a bump on a log. And so works and faith work together. And therefore, the righteous acts of the saints mean something. Your acts can't save you, but you can't be saved without righteous acts. And you can't even do righteous acts unless you're connected to the vine of Jesus Christ, because it is through him that you can do all things. It is through him that you have the ability to even obey. But let me tell you, if you don't have him, you can't obey. No wonder a, fruit is or a tree is judged by its fruit, because you have to be connected to the root. You have to be connected to Jesus to be able to do good works. But nonetheless, if you're not connected to Jesus, you don't have forgiveness, and therefore you will not have works. But the white robes stand for this righteousness. In Mark chapter 9, verse 2, it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up on a high mountain where they were all alone. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. And it says, There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. Guys, this is not an accident that just before Jesus is about to make atonement for us, become that atoning sacrifice, he put on white clothes, dazzling white, as our high priest. The same exact sequence of events. And by the way, Jesus tells them, the disciples don't tell anybody until after the crucifixion. In other words, until after atonement has been made. So, <coughs> excuse me, he, Jesus wears the white garments just before becoming that sacrifice. Now in verse 5 of Leviticus 16, it says, He shall, the high priest, shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. The two goats make a sin offering. Now that's interesting because it is, even in the Hebrew, a plural, single offering, but yet two goats. How do two goats make one offering? Well, first of all, I want you to see this, is this means that Yeshua is going to be re represented in both goats. But at the same time, each goat represents something different too. You see, these two goats making a single sin offering is going to be pictured in something I'm about to show you. But I want you to see that, notice in this picture, you can see that the high priest had two assistants. One on his right was a prefect, and on his left was the head of his father's house. And so when this priest is about to make the, the high priest the, the sacrifice of atonement, there were the two goats and then two people on both sides. When Yeshua was about to become the sacrificial uh, atonement as our high priest, there was somebody on both sides of him on the cross as well, right? Yes. One of them is to be the head of his 
father's house. Don't forget that. You'll understand why that's important in a minute. <clears throat> Verse 8, Then Aaron shall cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. What would happen is they would bring those goats to the high priest. The high priest <clears throat> would have basically a lottery box in front of him. He would reach in with one hand and grab a little stone, reach in with the other hand and grab another stone. And one was white, one was black. And what would happen is he would open up his hands. And if the lot... For the Lord was in his right hand, then the priest on his right hand would say basically this. He would say, my Lord the priest, raise up your right hand. If it was in the left hand, he would say, my Lord, the guy on his left hand would say, my Lord the priest, lift up your left hand. And so you would lift up the left hand for the lot for the Lord. That means that the goat on the left would be the one that would be sacrificed. If it was in your right hand, then the goat on the right would be the one that was sacrificed. What happened to the other goat? Well, it became known as the scapegoat. Now, in Hebrew, the word scapegoat is Azazel, and that's going to be important as well. Now, what they would do then is they would tie a red ribbon, basically, around the neck of the throat of the goat that was to be uh, sacrificed to the Lord. Then they would also tie a ribbon around the head of the goat that was to be the scapegoat, and it was taken out into the wilderness. After the high priest would lay his hand on the head of the goat, putting all the sins of the people on that goat, and then the sins were taken out into the wilderness to Azazel. Now, you can go do a duck, duck, go search of Azazel, and you will find out that Azazel is the name of a demon. Even the book of Enoch talks about them as one of the fallen angels who came down to Mount Hermon and led so many people astray. The picture, the Jews say, is that this goat of Azazel was almost like the devil himself in that the sins of the people were taken back to the original owner of them and then taken out into the wilderness so that they would leave the community and never come back ever again. Well, it goes on here in verse 9, And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell, okay, the, the one to be sacrificed, and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. Now, like I said, it's, this demon is like a, a wilderness demon, uh, which I find interesting that the Bible talks about uh, you know, demon-possessed people, and if somebody casts out these demons, they go out into the barren wilderness until they can find some place to rest, to come back, some, some host that is not following God, basically. So uh, what would happen then is this goat that was sacrificed to the Lord, they would take the blood and they would bring it into the most holy place, put some on the horns of the altar of the altar of incense, and then go through the veil and then pour some blood on the right side of the mercy seat or the Ark of the Covenant. Now I find that very interesting that it was on the right side because when Jesus ascends to heaven, where does he sit? At the right hand of God. Because even that was being pictured. Our goat, our atoning sacrifice, his blood is put on the right hand of the throne, the mercy seat, the throne of God. Now, not only that, but we see that the priest would basically take some hyssop and they describe it as cracking the whip, uh, that it sounded like that as they would crack and throw the blood of this goat, this sacrifice from the, the altar that it was sacrificed on all the way to the mercy seat. The blood would leave a trail then from there to the mercy seat and it stops there. Just like the blood, guess what? It stops at the mercy seat. When Yeshua died on the cross, there is no need for sacrifice anymore. As Hebrews says, one sacrifice for all. The death he died, he cannot die again. The blood stops. The sacrifices are over. It stops at the throne of God. 
And that's where Jesus sits and stops. So an amazing picture that is going on here. Now, as I said, there are three cords that are tied. There's a cord tied on the scapegoat. There's a cord, or this red bandana or ribbon tied on the sacrificial goat. And then they would hang one on the temple or in the tabernacle. History records this in, in a number of different places. But that, that red bandana would miraculously turn white. <clears throat> and this is why we see Isaiah chapter 1 talking about, though your sins be as scarlet, the sins were placed on that goat. So you have the scarlet thread, the scarlet ribbon, but it says they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That goat that was led off into the wilderness with that red bandana, they say that it would miraculously turn white and that the red ribbon that was hung in the tabernacle or temple would also miraculously turn white, showing that their sins had been forgiven. Now, I believe that that really did happen, by the way. It, there's just too much history to record that it didn't. Well, what's fascinating to me is that the, the Jewish Talmud, their history records a very important event. 40 years, it says here, for 40 years before the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, basically, the thread of scarlet never turned white. It remained red. Remember that the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. 40 years before that is exactly when Yeshua dies on the cross. Now, fascinating enough, the reason that some of the rabbis say that this miracle stopped is because there was a false Messiah that came and too many people followed him. So it was punishment. Not at all. In fact, the real Messiah showed up and Yeshua was trying to say something. The blood stops here. There is no more sacrifice. It is white forever and you don't need to hang up a red ribbon ever again because atonement is done if you will recognize Yeshua as Messiah and your high priest. So what an amazing picture that is seen here. The other thing is this. Remember that Yeshua was presented by Pilate and Pilate gave the, the Jews an opportunity to say, free your king, free your Messiah. He said, which one do, I want, do you want me to release? Yeshua Bar Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus of Nazareth? Yeshua or Yeshua? Two goats. Isn't it interesting that we see Barabbas, this man of insurrection, that his, why was he arrested? Because he was trying to take authority by himself, for himself. Just like the devil wants to be like God. The devil wants to have authority. And here we see Barabbas. And by the way, remember, it's Jesus Barabbas. What does that mean? His name means Yeshua Barabbas. The Lord saves the Son of the Father. Which is very interesting. Now you have these two goats. The Lord saves the Son of the Father. And then the Lord saves. Remember that there were the two priests on the side. One was the head of the Father's house and the other was the prefect. Well, here we see Barabbas is let off and we never hear of him again, just like that goat was let off and you were never to see it ever again. I believe that these, th this whole story of Barabbas in Scripture is a picture of this, that Barabbas, in a sense, was a picture of Azazel, this demon, this evil, wicked person that was led off and the sins were taken off. Now, again, Jesus is also both goats. When we see these analogies, and this is not just in atonement, this is all throughout scripture, he's all of it. And so Jesus was not just a sacrificial goat, but there was he is the scapegoat that is led into the wilderness as well. How? He descends into hell. And he goes back to the original owner of the sins. Where does he go? He descends into hell and he proclaims his victory there. 
That is in the spiritual. But in the physical, we see Barabbas being a picture of it and Yeshua being the other goat. So what a beautiful picture here of both goats with Yeshua. It continues on in verse 15 of Leviticus 16. Then he shall, the high priest, shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people, bring its blood inside the veil, and do with the blood as he did with the blood of the bull, and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So on and before, as we already said, on the right side, and a cracking of the whip. That's how he would do that. So I'm going to continue on in verse 18. He shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. This is the only time that the altar of incense, which was just before the most holy place, that the blood was put on those horns on this day of Yom Kippur. Now, what is the altar of incense for? Revelation is very clear. It says that it is the prayers of the saints. So it tells us, the scriptures tell us, this is about prayers. Well, Jesus is our mediator. I think it's Timothy that says there is one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus. The only person who can mediate between us and God was Yeshua. And let that be a lesson to those who pray to Mary or any other saint because you think that you know there is a mediator for you. No, there can be none other than Jesus. That is what it says very clearly in the Bible. One mediator between God and man, the man Jesus, the Lord Jesus. So what's fascinating about this, just a little side note, uh, we see that in Revelation, I believe at the fifth seal, we see that there are those who have been slain, saints of God who have been killed for the testimony of Jesus. They are before the altar, this very altar. Their prayers are going up because they're saying, how long, O Lord, until you come and avenge our blood? And so here are these saints, their prayers at the altar of incense. And then right after they say this, there is an angel who comes and takes coals from that altar and hurls those coals down on the earth. What I find fascinating about that is in Romans, it tells us this, quoting the Old Testament as well, that it says that if your enemy is hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in so doing, you will heap burning coals upon their head. I think that that may be more literal than a lot of people realize. In other words, we have all kinds of enemies that are coming against us as Christians. And what's going to happen? If we love them and they continue to reject us, you might say attack the Lord's anointed, then there will be literally burning coals from this altar of incense that are hurled down on the earth and as we see when that happens, there are all these judgments that come upon the world. When we love our enemy and live righteously and pray for them, what you are doing is storing up wrath for them. You are heaping up burning coals if they do not repent on them. So very interesting here that the blood of atonement is placed on the altar of incense there at a perfect picture of Jesus. Verse 20, when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, okay, the blood has been splattered on the mercy seat, the tabernacle of meeting in the altar, the altar of incense, he shall then bring the live goat, that uh, scapegoat, Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. And so there's a prayer that they would basically say as they would lay their hands on this goat. The high priest would lay their hands on it. It says, O Lord, your people, the house of Israel, have committed iniquity, transgressed, and sinned before you. Forgive, O Lord, I pray the iniquities and transgressions and sins which you, which you people, the house of Israel, have committed and transgressed and sinned before you, as it is written in the Torah of Moses, your servant. For on this day 
shall atonement be made for you to cleanse you from all your sins shall you be clean before the Lord. So even in their prayer, they're saying, on this day, forgiveness is going to come. And look what happened. Yeshua came. And you say, yeah, but it was on the day of Passover. Yes, but on the day of Passover, he became the day of atonement. But as I said, I believe when he returns the second time, the first time he came to be the Passover lamb, the second time he is going to bring about atonement, which means judgment for the ungodly and final um, uh, receiving what has already been done for the godly. So as it, we continue here on Azazel, as I said, go do a, a little bit of search on that. Nemonides says that this Azazel belonged to the class of Sa'arim, a goat-like demon that haunts the desert. And so just some interesting aspects to Azazel. Um, verse 21 says, And ye shall send it away into the wilderness by the hands of a suitable man. We read that, but I want you to see two things. First of all, sending it away into the wilderness. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west so far has he removed our transgression from us. You see, our sins are taken away into the wilderness, never to be returned again. Our sins on the Day of Atonement, if you are a child of God, under the blood of Jesus, will never come back. I mean, this is why they made sure it was taken out into the wilderness, because it would be a bad thing to see this goat coming back into town. No, my sins are coming back. No, it had to be taken away. Now, as far as by the hands of a suitable man, I find that very important as well because uh, we're going to see that that goat was led out by a suitable man. That goat as well, I'm going to bring this together, so just hang on to that uh, thought for a moment. That goat as well, as he was being led out, the records tell us here, it says, according to tradition, uh, quite a commotion occurred when the goat began his journey to the solitary place. The goat was greeted along the way by people who would pull his wool, spit at him, and prick him. Remember, this is a picture of Jesus as well. Matthew 26, verse 67 says, when Jesus is being led to the cross, out to the wilderness, they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with their palms of their hands. Or Isaiah 50, verse 6 says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. What they did to this goat leading it out is exactly what they did to Yeshua. And I keep saying leading the goat out. Because that's what scripture says, that that goat was led out by a suitable man and Yeshua was also led out to the cross. Because there was a man that was pulled from the crowd, Simon of Cyrene, that carried the cross for him and Yeshua simply followed, beaten, stricken. And Simon of Cyrene, we see it seems to be later in scripture that he was a follower, a disciple of Jesus. So he was led out by the hands of a suitable man. I mean, the pictures here are just incredible. Verse 22, The goat shall bear on, on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him, on Yeshua, the iniquity of us all. You see, that goat bared the sin of the whole community. The priest put all those sins on the head of that goat, and they were taken away. Yeshua, all of our sins were laid on him. You see, this verbiage is there for a reason. It isn't an accident, and that's why every word is important. But this is exactly what's going on on the Day of Atonement. Now verse 23 says, Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting and shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place. 
and he shall leave them there. Note, this is huge, guys. That after the high priest made atonement, he took off his garments and he left the garments there. And they were never to be used again. Here's what it says in the uh, Talmud again. And the priest, he shall store them away, the clothing. This teaches us that they require, that they require being stored away forever. And he shall not use those four garments, those four linen garments, for any other Yom Kippur. So the priest would never use them again, just like what did Jesus do? When he made atonement for us, his garments, he was wrapped in linen, right? His garments were then also taken off, and what did he do? He left them in the tomb, saying they were never to be used again. There will never be a need of another sacrifice. His clothes were left behind. Now, that is, in the physical sense, the garments were left behind, but it's also a picture of a spiritual sense. In 2 Corinthians 5.16, it says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. You see, Jesus put on fleshly garments for us. It says, Yet now we know him thus no longer. He is never going to again put on those fleshly garments. Now he has the garments of glory. Which, by the way, we see that after the resurrection, that's one reason why the disciples didn't recognize him right away. It was different. And so, in a spiritual sense, leaving those clothes behind shows that Jesus is never going to wear the garment of flesh ever again. He's never going to die again. It is all so prophetic. And so, that mercy seat where the blood of Yeshua was placed on it, on that, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant, the, the atonement cover, the, the price has been paid and it never needs to be paid again. So if you think that you can earn your salvation by being good enough, you think that you can add your blood to that of Yeshua, you're wrong. As a matter of fact, if that's what you think, you, you don't know Yeshua. So this lower half of the ark, the the basically it's called the ark, I should say. But the upper cover, the part that covered it, was called the mercy seat. And that is where God sits and meets with man. And that is what Yeshua has given us access to. So, when the devil says that you can't be forgiven or that you're too far gone, remember this. Remember the power of God has come through Yeshua. And so... This coming week, we are going to be celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles because what we're celebrating is atonement has been made. Remember that we had these 30 days before the Feast of Trumpets and then the 10 days of awe. Together it made 40 days of repentance. And then the Day of Atonement took place and we have these now days to prepare our sukkah, to be ready. And... I kind of see this as the, there's troubled times, trumpets come, the Lord, what happens, we see in Revelation, He is going to gather you and He takes you to Jerusalem. And during that time, right after that, we're going to see a period of judgment. And then after that, we see we get to live with Him. We get to dwell with Him, and He will tabernacle with us. That is what we are celebrating we are celebrating this coming week the Feast of Tabernacles that God has made a way for us to live with Him and for Him to live with us. He now lives and dwells in tabernacles in us. And so atonement has been made. And as we celebrate this, we're not only remembering the past that atonement has been made, but we look forward to the future when it will be lived out fully. And Israel will be judged by God and the sins be atoned for no more. Judgment has already been placed on God. Now again, this is if you know Yeshua as your Savior. And so keep that in mind as we celebrate. This is a celebration worthy of honor. 
and we need to take it seriously. Why would we not want to do this? Why would we not want to recognize that atonement has been made and look forward to the fact that he's coming back and what is in the physical will become in the spiritual, even, I might say, even more physical, more real. So with that, we're going to close and uh, just take this time this week to, to truly celebrate the festivals God has commanded us to do, to honor what his sacrifice was and is for us. God bless.